Okay, welcome back, everyone. I think I just started recording <laughs> just randomly. Uh, like yeah, welcome back, everyone, to Effing with the Ineffable. I am Zoe. I am Smokey Piggleton. And Fresh, freshly shorn Smokey Piggleton. Yeah, you were probably much more hairy the last time we saw you. Probably. Uh, you cut all your hairs uh, over Christmas break. So. Wow. Yeah. all of them um today is uh mlk day so we decided to film a podcast um i had a dream we decided to film a podcast mainly just because my dad doesn't have to work today and it is snowing here we got a lot of snow and windy and nasty out yeah it's gross i went outside to put some wood in the fire and I didn't have my coat on. I just was in shirt sleeves and it didn't take me long to like, okay, I got to go put a coat on. I yeah. That's and stand here long enough to put this wood in the fire. Yeah. That's not a good, not a good plan. We, I, we're not going anywhere for a, a long while because, well, I don't know, probably by tomorrow afternoon, it'll all be melted because it's supposed to be warm tomorrow. Yeah. But, but it's not supposed to get warm today. No, not tonight. So we're not going anywhere today. And we didn't, we couldn't go anywhere yesterday because we've been just snowed in. Yeah. So I'm wondering if I'll be able to go to work tomorrow. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you you have less of like a well, I don't know. I don't know. I got a little hill there. I got a little hill there going down over yeah. by the other end of the, the street. So who knows? Oh, I got my old shirt. I got my old job shirt on. Yeah. That's where you used to work. Not, not anymore. Now you work at the prison. Your new job shirt is like a orange jumpsuit. Just kidding. <laughs> it's one of those, it's one of those old fashioned black and white striped, striped things ones. With, those, with those cool caps that they used to <laughs> Why have. Why did they give them those? That doesn't make any know. sense. <laughs> I don't know. Oh um, man that's those, funny those were sweet <laughs> um so yeah we we were just talking right before we started recording about um reading and uh because i was saying i'm tired today because first of all this little buddy um didn't just just want he he it takes a while to go to sleep at night like he has a period of being pretty alert and awake right before he has like a good chunk of sleep and last night he didn't fall asleep until like after 11 so it was pretty late um but also I'm teaching my kindergartner how to read and um because we homeschool and that's just it's tiring and it tries my patience like every day and uh yeah homeschooling is very hard but rewarding at the same time and Smokey Piggleton's dog is there. Hey, Oscar. The big black rat. <laughs> Both holding our babies, our baby boys. Mm -hmm. He doesn't smell quite as your nice baby, as my your baby, baby boy. boy. Got baptized the other day. I know, and I was gonna say he he smell. He, we keep smelling his head, even though. Um. The chrism is the chrism is, is pretty is pretty much gone by now, but he uh he smelled really good for a few days there. And um yeah, he got baptized. It was because of all the storm we got, his godparents couldn't be there, unfortunately. But um it was nice. My family it was just basically just my family and the priest and then um our church secretary. And it was it was very nice. So we did it in the old form so he got the extraordinary form yeah he got it and they call it that because it's beyond the ordinary because they call it that because like yeah it's not the they consider the novus ordo to be the ordinary form so you're like it's it's uh like a special thing when you do the extraordinary form basically yeah so um he got 
the exorcisms and the blessed salt and all that stuff. So it was really nice. The branding, the colonoscopy, <laughs> it, the, the full, you got the full Monty. The full treatment. No, it was, it was really good. Um, I'm happy it worked out. And then, yeah, we went to church that night because by the next morning we were not going anywhere because it is when it snows here, it's just everything shut down. So, yeah, they don't have any snow removal. They got a lot of grass removal machines, but yeah. they don't have any snow <laughs> removal machines because we really don't get snow that much, really, maybe so. a few days a year. So it's not worth it for them to have that. And it melts almost immediately. Yeah. It's not, it's not like when we were living up north where if you got snow in December, it stayed until April unless yeah. you moved it. So. Pretty much. I remember, um, so Michigan Technical College or whatever it's called, Michigan Tech. Um, I went there once for a program and that's up in Houghton, right? Right. Uh, it's up in Houghton, which is, like literally, I mean, it's like, yeah, Mich the top of Michigan is like a mitten and it's like way up there. So it's literally like way, you can, way up by the what they call the Keweenaw Peninsula. Yeah, you can basically jump right, to Canada, which is right in. This is the Lake Superior mm -hmm. up in here and it is cold. Yeah, I was going to say they I remember they said, I think there's only been like one month at michigan tech where they've never had snow like yeah. they've, they've had snow in every month except maybe august or something like they've had snow in july there which yeah. is just like yeah why people choose to live there i don't know but you know and you try to swim in lake superior and you just step in and it's just needles and pins it's so cold even in like the middle of summer it's cold all the time yeah yeah it actually freezes over and the animals can walk out to Isle Royal and stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. But anyway. It's beautiful, um, it's beautiful but it's bleak. It is. It is really beautiful. Like I sometimes miss living up there, like where I went to school in Marquette, Michigan. Because um, there's just so much. On like, the lake. Yeah, yeah. Like everybody, it's just like a beautiful place to be. There's nice hiking and just yeah. animals and all kinds of fun things but um well that's true here i was yeah i took oscar for a walk this morning we saw some deer off in the woods it's like oh nice yeah no i don't want to move we back there about, i definitely we saw about deer. 50 turkeys one day wow it was just this huge flock and i didn't realize they could fly as well as they can they flew way up into these pine trees so interesting yeah, they are, and they're big birds too. So it's interesting that Very they big. can get yeah. themselves up that far. Um, yeah. So yeah, we were talking about reading and why, uh, and how reading is important, but reading isn't everything, which I think is uh, something that you know I, I'm always trying to figure out. I've been homeschooling for what I don't know, two years now or something. Even though my daughter's only in kindergarten. But I mean, really homeschooling happens all the time. You basically homeschool your children since birth, really. Um, even now, like my three-year-old, we don't do anything formal, but she talks about doing schoolwork, which is she, of her own accord, I don't ask her to do things, but she like loves tracing um, numbers on a whiteboard. We have like a whiteboard with numbers on it and she likes tracing them. She does like her letter and number puzzles to try to learn them. Um, she's always asking like, how many does this make? How many does this make? Like, so mm -hmm. it's, it's just interesting how kids want to learn. Um, but yeah, anyway, I, I, it's, it's interesting trying to figure out kind of my philosophy about how I want to teach my kids. Cause there's so many different philosophies right now. I'm reading a book called the well-trained mind. <clears throat> And it's a, it's really like an explanation, a pretty deep dive explanation into the classical model of education. So there's like the grammar stage, the rhetoric, the grammar, logic, and rhetoric stages. And then you kind of 
you're teaching to like the child as they develop according to like the classical model. It's, it's interesting. And then I've read a lot about Charlotte Mason education and, you know, obviously I grew up in a very traditional school setting where it was a brick and mortar school. And then I went to public school. Um, so it's just interesting trying to figure out what kind of my style is, but I think what I've landed on is I am a minimalist homeschooler in the sense that I would basically be an unschooler if I could, meaning I just want my kids to learn from experience and learn through their interests. Um, that's, that's kind of a, like a Montessori principle or a um, Summerhill. Have you ever heard of Summerhill? Summerhill was a, that was a school of teaching back, popular back in the 60s um, based on uh, this, I forget who the guy was, but he had a, he had a fun principle or he just kind of let people learn ad lib, you know, if yeah. they didn't want, if they didn't want to learn to read, that's okay. When they'll, when they're motivated to learn to read, they'll be easier to teach. Yeah, huh. exactly. Yeah. yeah, I and and a lot of people make the argument that like, you know, if your brain isn't ready to take in the information, it's just not going to stick. That's why like in the in the public school system, they basically have to throw the same things at you year after year after year after year and hope that eventually like they'll learn it. Whereas, hopefully, like, hopefully they get it through the the. Hopefully the window is open at <laughs> at some point when yeah. they're tossing that. Yeah, um, my my friend in D.C. Um, she sends her kids to a, um, it's called a Sudbury. Va it's basically like a Sudbury Valley style school, which is like a democratic school. So, the children are completely in charge of what they learn and when they want to learn it. And not only that, but the children also like they make all the rules for the school. It's very, it's very interesting. Um, you would think it would be like most people hear that and they're like, oh, it's like chaos, whatever. But um, actually, the problem is kids take all day, every day. They, <laughs> they well, they tend to make really extreme rules that you kind of have to then be like, okay, this probably isn't a good rule to have all the time because if somebody if somebody does something that you don't like, then you want to make it a rule. Like kids want to make that a rule to be like, okay, we don't get to do that anymore. Um, I don't know. It's very interesting, but they, I mean, they, in that school, like it's completely normal for kids to not know how to read when they're eight, nine, 10 years old, because they have to want to, they have to ask to learn it here, buddy, don't hit the microphone. They have to ask to learn it. And if they're not, if they're not ready to learn it, they, they just don't, they don't learn it. But I went to an open house there and I thought it was very interesting that um, the, one of the graduates of the, he had graduated and he was in college now from that school. He was saying, you know, when I got to, when I got to like my later high school years, I realized I wanted to go to college. I knew what I wanted to go for. And I knew I had to learn math and reading to, to pass my SAT. And so I studied the things that I needed to learn. And you can basically learn all of K through 12 math in about six months if you are motivated and like at that maturity level. So that's another thing where it's like, they, we, we spend hours and hours and hours every year teaching kids stuff that like if they're just at the re if they're ready to grasp the material they'll just get it in in a very short amount of time so anyway well and that's why you know reading is good because then you can you can learn at your own pace when yeah. you're reading you don't have to ask anybody else anything you can you can google it you can uh go on whatever these days i mean there's all this digital media there's there's all these free schools that are online that you can just do stuff if you want to learn a new language you know you just crank up duolingo or what babble or whatever the different things are yeah 
Yeah. So it, and that's why, like, I would consider my I don't consider myself like necessarily a complete unschooler because I do teach my kids like I, I put an emphasis on teaching my kids. Sorry, I'm moving all over the place here. All right. Um, reading like how to read and basic math skills. Hi, buddy. And um, religion. Those are I mean, those are the big three things that I teach. But I feel like if you know basic math functions, adding, subtracting, dividing, multiplying, fractions, you know, that kind of stuff. And if you know how to read, then you can just teach yourself whatever you're interested in. I mean, my daughter right now is reading. Um, she's she's listening to the audiobook of Peter Pan, and she's really interested in that. Um, we're reading The Hobbit together, but it's like, there's so many things that she's learning, even from those fictional books. She's, we learned, we had like five words yesterday that when I was reading The Hobbit out loud to her, I stopped and I said, do you know what that word means? And she said, no. And then I would explain what the word meant to her. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's fun how you can learn. The world is full of learning opportunities. If you're, if you're able to take them, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah and that's and that's why like um that uh that positive parenting talks about just providing a, a providing a rich and stimulating environment for kids so that they're exposed to a lot of things the things that they become interested in or curious about at any particular point they can um, they can ask about those or they can look those up or whatever and then find out more about it. Um, it's and just kind of a learn at your own pace thing. Uh, you know, back in the old days, kids would just learn from example. There wouldn't even be a lot of formal education or, you know, uh, lecturing or anything like that. They would just they would be kind of apprenticed yeah. to their parents. Uh, the kids would be in the kitchen. Mom would be cooking. They'd you know start to understand some basic ideas about you know chemistry and cooking and uh, you know all the different things that you need to know there. A certain yeah. a little bit of math. Um, you know, oh, we're going to double the recipe. So now we need this much instead yeah. of, yeah. Yeah, it, we're, we're reading the whole um, uh, Little House on the Prairie series this year in school. And um, there's a lot in, in uh, Farmer Boy, which is the book about uh, Almanzo Wilder, who like his childhood when he grew up and married Laura Ingalls. Um, but, you know, his dad was like, basically he, he raised animals. Um, and his dad said, like, you have to know, you have to know math because you have to know, like, okay, if I'm selling 60 horses and I'm getting $50 a horse, how much money is that going to be? But it was like, that was the kind of math that he learned was because it was just through that, like practical life stuff. Um, and even like it, it, we're now reading on the banks of Plum Creek and Laura and Mary are like eight and seven and eight or eight and nine. And they're going to a school for the first time. Like that was what we just read today because they're finally, they live two and a half miles from town, which is the closest they've ever lived to a town. So now they can walk to school every day. And it's just interesting. Like she just the whole, the whole method of like them learning, like Mary has completely learned to read being at home. She's never set foot in a school before her. Now her, their mom was a teacher before she got married and moved off to the woods. But, um, she's basically, Carolyn. they basically just taught her to read through like one of those little primers, which are, which basically say, c-a-t cat and you basically just learn from there i mean a lot of people still use the mcguffey primer to teach their kids to read and that was published in like the 18 1870s or something like it, it yeah uh, um 
The Well-Trained Mind is a really interesting book. Uh, it, it's making me think a, a lot about the way we teach kids to, to, to read and learn and just all kinds of stuff. Anyway, we can talk about other things. I just... Uh, no, yeah. those are good things to talk about. Yeah, you, you ever you've you haven't watched The Wire. The Wire is no. too it's too violent for you. Well, part of it is I I just don't take the time to watch a lot of like movies and TV. Um, yeah. But also I I don't really care about violence. Violence doesn't bother me that much. But like um like sexual content and stuff really bothers me i try not to watch is there much of that in the wire i don't even know yeah there is yeah there's both because yeah. it's hbo right yeah yeah so they just try so, to so put mom, mom is just at the end of re-watching the whole series um and there's a there's one of the <clears throat> one of the seasons goes through watching these uh through the like the Baltimore schools and there's a bunch of kids that they kind of follow through the schools and um this one uh this one teacher who used to be a policeman who really doesn't have a lot of teaching experience but I guess they just they just need warm bodies or something I don't know <laughs> <laughs> but he he starts talking to them about different things and and what what they're interested in and you know fractions and stuff like that and he he starts using examples that they would be familiar with in their life like if they spent any time on the corners dealing drugs they'd be like okay so you've got it you've got three teenths and each teenth is worth uh, this much how much would a hole be you know, it's like, yeah, okay, and, and they get that. I yeah. mean, they're they. That's just like it comes to them. But if you talk about, you know, the abstract, they could care less. Yeah. Um, well, and and, and, and probabilities. Yeah. He uses these. He, he uses. I forget if he uses craps, shooting craps, or some kind of card game. Uh, but they just love that, and they. they they're all into that. They're learning the probabilities in a hurry. It's like, oh, now I know how to bet when it comes to yeah. gambling. Yeah. That reminds me of like my, you know, we haven't really learned fractions yet, but my kids will be like, I want the bigger half. Like, you know, they, they'll always say, because right. I'll say like, I'll cut it in half and they'll be like, I want the bigger half. It's like, that's kind of how kids learn, learn even like fractions and stuff is just like through yeah, through practical life stuff, especially like in the classical through, model. Of, through pizza. <laughs> yeah, in the classical model of education, they would say, and and like a, like definitely Montessori would say too that um, like kids at that age can't, they don't have that abstract thought process yet. They have to have it grounded in reality because they're just, they're not ready to move on to that like abstract thinking. Um mm -hmm. I feel like even my brain these days, I'm, I'm not very good at the abstract thought. Like when I'm tired. Yeah, here, here's an abstract I was having with uh, with your youngest brother okay. the other day. I said, okay, now zero divided by anything is, is just zero. But anything divided by zero is what? One, right? No. If you divide anything, zero, no anything divided by itself is one. Okay. See, this is testing my. If you, if you have a, if you have a pie made of eight pieces and you divide it by eight, you you have one piece. Yeah. 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 Uh, but anything divided by zero, he says, is undefined. And then, and so he said. Now, when you have zero divided by zero, it is either zero, if you take the principle that zero divided by anything is zero. It is one, if you take the principle that anything divided by itself is one, or it is undefined, if you take the principle that anything divided by zero is undefined. See, like, this is where, this is where math, I just kind of like, I feel like they didn't do, you glaze over. It's they like, didn't do a good job of explaining this to me in, in math in school because 
It's like I hear this that. is ineff this is ineffable. It this is, is this it is, is ineffable. literally actually, ineffable. I mean, if you actually just think about what you're talking about, you're just talking about I have nothing and I'm dividing it by nothing. And it's like, well, why is that even useful how does to that talk even, about? How, yeah, how is there even any definition there? How can that be defined? Yeah. So anything divided yeah. by nothing is undefined is what is what your brother says i said anything divided by zero tends toward infinity because if you if you start if you start at one if you have a, a something that is worth eight you divide it by one you get eight eight divided by one is eight if you divide it by a half so you, you you're making that denominator smaller it's 16 it's 16 so that gets bigger if you if you make it even smaller divide it by a quarter it's 32 so it's it's tending toward bigger 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 if you divide it by a hundred it's 800 if you divide it by a million it's eight million if you divide it by a trillion, it's a trillion. So it's tending toward infinity as you get closer down to zero in the denominator. So that's why I always learned that everything divided by zero is infinity. But he says it's undefined. This is, this is, this is probably... And everybody, again, who's, my, my, everybody who's not a nerd has already like glazed <laughs> over and it's like, ah, oh, crap, I picked the wrong day to watch this show. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and even my like, I feel like when I'm, you know, when you're tired and hungry, you kind of lose your, at least I do, I lose my ability to abstract thought and today I'm tired. Right. So it's like, why are we even like, wh why even talk about it? Because it's like, what is what does dividing by zero actually mean? I guess I just don't even understand like what that actually means. How do you how do you divide by nothing? Anyway, which is why zero was the last concept of numbers to, to be actually developed. be introduced. Yeah, because it didn't it didn't have any reference in the real world. Yeah, I mean, like I can see now like teaching because we've already covered zero in, in school with my daughter and I can kind of it's like you have one thing and you take away one thing and you have nothing left like you can kind of understand the idea of not having a thing but you can't you can't really understand it until you understand it as like an a, like a deprivation of something an absence of something mm -hmm. um it doesn't really make sense on its own so I do yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> really that was, stuff here. How do we oh yeah, that yeah, about math and uh did you want to talk about the universe 25? Let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah, that that creeps you out, huh? Yeah, well, it was mainly like the old footage of it that creeped me out. I'll I'll try to link the video you you were uh, yeah. did you watch the video at all i did watch some video of it yeah so why don't you explain what it is for everybody who's waiting okay. with bated breath so okay so the, the, this was um it was a initially came up from something called rat park this guy uh, this guy named john calhoun um Developed a uh, developed a park that would be a utopia for rats. He 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 basically set it up so that they would not have to uh, they wouldn't have to work to eat. They wouldn't have to work to build uh, any kind of uh, any any kind of nest. There was nests provided for them. Uh, there was no predation. So they didn't have to worry about any predators. It was just a, a pure area for rats to be able to live without any stress. That just was to kind the, of see what would happen, I guess, because it's that like, was the theory. Just to see, yeah, if if we had a utopia, yeah, if we had a if we had a a rat utopia, 
what would happen? Which I think is like an interesting concept because I've thought before, like, you know, you hear about animals in captivity versus animals in the wild and like how their lifespans being different and that kind of thing. And I've thought before too, like, it's interesting. Like, I wonder what the lifespan of a human being would be if you, if you kind of kept them in like a utopia like that, where it's like, they're not going to die in a car crash. They're not going to die of like, I mean, obviously like we're not going to live forever. Like eventually, eventually your body kind of stops working, but it's like, you don't have to, you don't have to wonder if that is already being played out. The progress that he, that humanity has made in being able to uh, provide shelter at with very little effort, provide yeah. food with very little effort, provide security with very little effort on everyone's part has already been in progress. Yeah, we're already we're already living at a point in time where uh, you don't have to worry about getting enough to eat. Yeah. You don't have to worry about having a place to sleep. You don't have to worry about uh, being preyed upon for the most part. I yeah. mean, th- th- there, are, there are exceptions and people certainly enjoy spending their time worrying about those possible <laughs> exceptions. Yeah. But uh, it's not necessary. You know, the, the, the experience of most people is one of plenty of food, all all needs met and all security provided for. So we're already kind of living in yeah. a in a rat utopia. We should talk about after we talk about Universe 25, we should talk about relative risk. Cause my husband and I were talking about that a lot the other day with in regards to COVID. Um, okay, let, let's hold off on that. Yeah, but talk about universe so, 25. So anyway, yeah, let me talk about this guy. Um John B. Calhoun set about creating a series of experiments that would essentially cater to every need of the rodents and then track the effect on their population over time. Uh, The most infamous of these experiments was named uh, Universe 25, which was his 25th iteration of this experiment. He He would develop this space that was perfectly attuned to uh, what he thought would be able to keep them uh, keep them just fine. In this study, he took four breeding pairs of mice, placed them inside a utopia. The environment was designed to eliminate all problems that would lead to mortality in the wild. They could access limitless food. Uh, they would uh, it, they would have water. Nesting material was provided. The weather was kept at 68 degrees, uh, which for those of you who aren't mice is the perfect mouse temperature. (laughs) The mice were were chosen for their health, obtained from the NIH breeding colony. Uh, Extreme precautions were taken to stop any diseases from entering their universe. Uh, So they were on permanent quarantine. They had to wear masks all the time. And be vaccinated. They were, there was a vax mandate. Uh, I'm just kidding. As well as this, no, no predators were in the utopia, which stands to reason, okay. The experiment began, and as you'd expect, the mice used the time that would usually be spent in foraging for food and shelter by having an excessive amount of sex. Uh, about every 55 days, the population doubled. As the, mice, as the mice filled the most desirable space within the pen, um, where access to the food tunnels, tunnels were uh, easiestly uh, accessed. When the population hit 620, the doubling slowed to every 145 days as the mouse society began to hit some problems. Certain mice split off into different groups and those who could not find a role in those groups found themselves with nowhere to go. And here's something, here's what Calhoun wrote. This was back in 72, which he had started doing these experiments in like 1945 or something like that. Right after- Really the, into this. Right after the Second World War. Yeah. And uh, so he said, in the normal course of events in a natural ecological setting, 
somewhat more young survive to maturity than are necessary to replace their dying or senescent established associates. The excess that finds no social niches emigrate. So if they if they're not if they can't find any meaningful engagement in the community, they leave and start their own community someplace else with no ability to emigrate. Mm. These these rats or mice uh, were just they found themselves with no social role to fill. Um, there was only so many alpha mice spots uh and so there a lot of these beta mice uh, just kind of uh lived in the uh on the edges of society um so what he saw was what he called a uh behavioral sink it led to a societal collapse and eventually the entire colony died the entire colony entire thing which is weird because they're being provided food and everything you would they think still like had all they still had all the food they still had all the all the things that they had at the beginning but they um he believed that they had a, a death of the spirit he he said uh there was a there was a there was a date where the whole the whole spirit of the colony died and after that, it was just a matter of time before all the bodies died. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, so he he said that there was this um, behavioral collapse. Um, many female rats were unable to carry pregnancy to full term or to, su to survive delivery of their litters. Uh, an even greater number after successfully giving birth fell short in their maternal functions. Among the males, the behavior disturbances ranged from sexual deviation to cannibalism and from frenetic overactivity uh, to a pathological withdrawal from which the individuals would emerge only to eat, drink, and move about only when other members of the community were asleep. So there was like mm. vampire mice who would just sneak around when it was when they wouldn't be noticed and when they yeah. yeah the enemy became the other mice yeah at one, at one point okay did he make a lot of like extrapolations onto human behavior from this yeah I, or was he mainly, mainly yeah, just i think he was careful i think he was careful not to but it would it certainly uh seemed to extrapolate pretty pretty readily I mean, Jordan Peterson talks about rats and humans and like, you know, similar circuitry in our brains a lot. Like he talks about how rats have a a play circuit, which means like they th this is more of a recent discovery, like they will work to be able to play, which I think before was not really like a thought of thing. Uh, it wasn't thought of that that like play was kind of seen as like a bonus, but not like something that animals would work for. But now like we know that rats have a play circuit and he talks a lot about like the intricacies of that, of how like a smaller rat and a bigger rat fighting, which is the, really the way they play is fighting, um, mm -hmm. play fighting. They will like the smaller rat has to be able to win at least a certain percentage of time or the smaller rat just won't play anymore with the bigger rat. But right, if there's no if there's no win, they just yeah. Like okay, I'm not playing anymore. Yeah. So the, I, it, it's like at least like thirty percent of the time or something they have to be able to win, otherwise they just will stop. Um, but yeah, I mean, and humans obviously have a play circuit. I mean, it's it, uh, it's it's interesting to to watch little kids just watch little kids i mean they will they will work hard to be able to yeah and they're interesting in that okay they're playing they're working to play but they're also playing the work that is they're, the work of childhood is they're playing, playing they're playing at work roles in family roles and uh, politics mm -hmm. and 
how things end up being fair and how to be socially appropriate. Uh, you know, they're, they're constantly working out those different dynamics in their play activities. Yeah. You know. So anyway, going on about this. Um, uh, so there was a death of this. Infant mortality ran as high as 96%. The mothers would... The mothers would just start abandoning their children and would not uh, would not tend to taking care of them at all. Um, and um, what else happened? Um, Lots of bad things. Yeah, he. Um, yeah. I'll link some of those. And they, volunt and they voluntarily crowded into different spaces. So it seemed like even though there was there was plenty of spaces for them to inhabit, um, they still would voluntarily kind of crowd. A lot of them would crowd together. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was certainly a, a, a social need that, uh, but, but he started to take this as, um, if you look it up, if you Google it, one of the questions that comes up is, what did Universe 25 prove? And this is interesting. Um, in Calhoun's view, the rise and fall of Universe 25 proved five basic points about mice. And then they say, as well as humans. Yeah. <laughs> the mouse is a simple creature, but it must develop the skills for courtship, child rearing, territorial defense and personal role fulfillment on the domestic and communal front. So I don't, is that five? I don't know if that's, I'll, that must be L5. But that's, that was Calhoun's take from this is that if you didn't have anything to do where you had to um, develop these skills, uh, you wouldn't develop the skills and the skills would then fall out of the entire social fabric uh, to the point where the society couldn't couldn't hold anymore. Yeah, I do wonder. Like, um, I can't remember if this is Jordan Peterson or somebody else who was talking about it, but he was saying, like, I wonder. Obviously, I do think a lot of that applies to humans. <clears throat> But at the same time, humans are like unique in that a lot of animals learn things like through in just like, a, I mean, so much of what animals do is instinct. And a lot of that is like passed on from generation to generation. Um, and humans, like, I, th I think it was Jordan Peterson was saying that, like, if you give a, um, if you give like a baby chimp, like a, a, a task to do and you show an adult doing it like a certain way but doing it like not the most efficient way um the chimp can eventually like will start off doing it that way but it will eventually learn like the better way to do it and will do it do it in a more efficient way but i think he said human beings like if you show a baby human being how to do something and you show them like the, the a not an efficient way they will just forever like keep copying the way that the parent did it because we're such like um mimetic monkey, monkey see monkey do yeah we're so like mimetic um learners like we just learn through imitation it's like you were saying about kids playing like when my kids play the way that they play mom is a lot of like imitating the things that I say and like but also like extrapolating from that and being able to inhabit the role of mom. But a lot of it is just like straight up imitation of things that they've seen. Um, yeah. So I, I do wonder, like there is a difference between, you know, mice and human beings. And yeah. I wonder like, even if one generation, cause it seems like in the mice experiment, when one generation kind of like loses those skills of like child rearing and personal development and all the things you listed, it's like no, the other, the, fur the further generations down the line don't seem to be able to recover that. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if 
human beings if that would be the same way. If there's one generation that's just completely, totally depraved, kind of just a total lost cause. Do you know anybody anybody who knows how to use an abacus? I mean, there's like ch- little Chinese kids who still can, but I, because they, they teach, I think they still teach it in, in China, like how to use an abacus. Smart. And actually there there is a very popular homeschooling math program that teaches how to use an abacus um i I knew how i learned how to use an abacus when i was in later elementary school early middle school before calculators became a uh widely uh available thing man you're Uh, old i am old yeah (laughs) i never taught my kids how to use an abacus and I have subsequently forgotten. Yeah, uh, I mean, it might come back to me with a little bit of uh, training, but that's a that's a simple uh, example. Yeah. Have you have you ever you've never read the the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? No, I know about it, but I haven't read it. Yeah, it's it's a good book. It, it, the guy talks about being self sufficient and no having these skills to be able to survive in the world without having to rely on all these uh, without having to rely on everybody do you know anybody who's able to fix their own car anymore i mean like it, you know we like grandpa yeah used to fix the cars yeah i think he's out of his league now because now yeah. like we we just the bought a new van cars yeah yeah we just bought a new van like it wasn't new but it, it you know it's only a few years old and they said it's got, I mean, it's just got hundreds, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of computers in the van. Computer chips. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know how to fix a computer chip. Like I can, right. I, I could maybe fi- I can figure out how to oil the hinges on the car. Like I can, <laughs> I can maybe figure out how to change the tire, but I'm not figuring out how to change, how to fix a computer chip if it breaks. That, that isn't going to help when the engine won't turn on. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, you will never have a pro-. He's like, with the brand of car that we have, he's like, you'll never have a problem with like the mechanic, like the physical makeup of the car. You're going to have a problem. If you have a problem with the car, it's going to be with the computer system. At some point, a computer is going to develop a short and you're not going to be able to function after that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that, yeah, it's not good for me because then I'm going to, I'm not not good for any of us. There's no such thing as a, uh, what do they call it? Like a backyard mechanic anymore. A, A guy who can just, who knows you know internal combustion engines who knows carburetors who knows uh, you know all the mechanics grandpa used to do that right? yeah. i mean out of necessity grandpa had to learn how yeah. to do that because he had to buy used cars because he couldn't afford a new car yeah and he had to figure out how to keep it going and how to you know do all that stuff well and i don't i learned some of that yeah watching him do it and helping him do it. Uh, but I have to say, I'm certainly not as confident in my ability to do even the basic things as well as he did. Yeah. Uh, I certainly, I certainly can't do, uh, you know, change a head gasket and stuff like that without, I'd have to look it up. Yeah. YouTube. Uh, which yeah. is which is the great thing is that there's yeah. there's this repository of wisdom that is available in books and on YouTube uh, that is available to all of us if we want to learn it. Yeah. Uh, you know, but the, that also means that we don't know it. Skills, a lot of those skills have kind of passed. Yeah. Wait, because um, because I was thinking like. You know, if you gave me like an old bicycle and if if it was broken and you didn't give me any access to the internet or anything, like I could probably figure out, like I know enough about how a bicycle moves that I could probably figure out how to fix it. But like it's a simple, it's a simple enough machine. Yeah, exactly. But if I could just Google it, like I probably wouldn't like I could figure it out and I could fix it, but I probably wouldn't know it as much as if I had to 
like literally just look at it and figure it out. That's how you actually know something to the point where you can do it again and again and again and fix different parts of it that break because you know Mm -hmm. all the different parts. Like if I, if I just Googled how to put the chain back on after the, after it comes off or something, like I would know how to fix that one part of the bike, but I wouldn't know all the different ways that it worked. Yeah. Um, Now here's, here's an interesting, another, another Google, when you Google about universe 25, uh, what was Calhoun's study about? And this is from the Washington Post. So okay. You can, so you can imagine what their take on this is going to be. Calhoun, a research psychologist at the NIMH for 40 years, discovered that severe crowding produced horrific behavioral changes among animals. The changes were so profound that the social order broke down and, the ultimate, and ultimately the entire rodent population collapsed. So they attribute it to severe crowding. The overpopulation Malthusian premise that if there was too many people, things society was going to break down. It wasn't a matter of too many people. It was a matter of not enough meaningful roles. Yeah. That's what that's what was that's what Calhoun himself said it was about. Yeah. Was this is- not being able able to develop these meaningful roles in a society uh, led people to just have a malaise. Yeah. It's what Father Dan used to refer to as affluenza. Yeah. People who have everything provided to them, people who have no challenges in life tend to just fall into a malaise. You know, they just, they, they it's like, nah, nothing matters. Uh, you know, nothing's, nothing's really important. Um, and they just become suicidal or just passive or, you yeah. know, they have, they have no dreams. They have no passions. They have no urges. Uh, they just become spoiled and um, useless. Yeah, don't they call that ennui or something? It's like, yeah. 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 But, yeah. Uh, you know, this, this brings up something that um, I've actually thought about this a lot. It's weird how kids will ask questions again and again and again and, it makes you think about things. Um, like my daughter, every week after church, she wants to ask our priest a question. Even if she doesn't have a question, she just will think of something. But one time she asked, like, why did Jesus um, come to work? Like, why did he have to work? Um, like, why did Jesus have to be a carpenter? Mm-hmm. And I think that was like a really profound question because it's like Jesus is the archetype of like what we are supposed to be right we're supposed to follow him and it's like Jesus didn't really have I mean like he could have like they said called angels down and have them serve have them serve bread to him and all that stuff he didn't he didn't need to be born naked in a barn he could have he could have come fully developed as a king and just established a kingdom boom like that yeah so it's so like why, why like work work is actually like we work is very important to human beings and we it's, it's ennobling. Yeah. It is ennobling. It 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 makes us noble to apply ourselves to something not just for our own good. I mean that's important too, but yeah. for the good of everyone. Mhm. And like, you know, um like I've been thinking about it because my husband isn't working right now, not working outside of the house. Um, cause he's still waiting to get his law license and all that stuff. And I was like, I kind of wish that he, we could just like have a homestead here and he would never have to go into work. Cause I kind of like having him around. And I think it'd be fun to just like raise our own food and just kind of just be a family, like off the, off the grid. But the thing is he really wants to be a lawyer like he really wants to go to work and be a lawyer he get, he's like upset it's not like he's he doesn't uh, have a passion for raising goats and chickens I mean, and we, we want to do those things together but it's more it's as a hobby yeah as a hobby um and and he like it's it's been nice because he has been developing skills here i mean that's the thing like 
even though he's not out working out of the house, he's working here. Like he is learning how to do woodworking so that he can fix our shed so that it can be for chickens. He learned how to build a raised garden bed. And we're learning how, like, we're learning how to turn our horrible soil into something that we can actually grow something in, which has been a long process. Um, but it I mean, is like, a long process. I've been here five years and I'm, I've still got just too much clay. Everything is just <laughs> clay. Even yesterday we made snowmen in our yard, but we were like rolling the snowballs to make them really big. And it's like, everything's just like it, it, you get under, as soon as you get underneath the grass, it's all red, muddy clay. And it just, so our snowmen look half red and like muddy. Um, but, but I mean, like he has, he has a desire to work. It's not like he just wants to be lazy and sit around. Like he is going crazy with the fact that he wants to be working a job that he thinks is really important, which is like the law, criminal law, and not just any part of the law. Cause he worked a job, a law job that he was like, this is just pushing papers. It's not doing anything like that. He thought right. was valuable. He's like, this will be replaced by computers in 10 years. So yeah. that's why he was like, I'm getting out of this because what's the point? Oh. Um, he's having a bad dream. But he, he's like, what's the point of having a job that is going to be replaced got by the gas? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can relate to that, too, because, um, you know, when I used to work at this, I was, I was busy, and I was serving a lot of people, and it was, it was very meaningful work. I didn't like the job too much. Um, and there, there was things about it that I didn't like, but, um, but it was certainly meaningful work. I don't feel like I have that now. And that's why I made that joke. What did I make that joke last time? Oh, I made it in the Christmas, in the letter. Christmas letter <laughs> about, you know, the employee appreciation and yeah, I feel appreciated. I just don't feel very well employed right now. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't feel that I'm using the skills and the knowledge base that I have uh, in the most optimal way, which it feels like it's um, like a shame. 